right, so I'm going to give a quick crash course on uh, management of ischemic stroke. So I'm going to kind of go through a lot of material, and I'll try to get through it all in half an hour. Um, so basically, I'm sure everyone here knows that um, stroke is a very prevalent disease. Uh, it's the number one cause of disability around the world. And in the United States, it's now down to the number five cause of mortality. Um, and one person dies from a stroke every four minutes and one person has a stroke every 40 seconds. Uh, so that's why it's very important that we kind of make sure that we're up to date and know how to you know, appropriately treat these patients because we see a lot, of, a lot of stroke. And so the first part of treating stroke is really before the patient even gets into the hospital and that's really public awareness and uh, you know, educating the public about what the signs and symptoms of stroke are um, so that either the patient themselves or their loved one can recognize the signs of a stroke and call 911 to get them into the ER as soon as possible. Uh, so I'm sure many of you have seen the FAST, um, this national awareness campaign to kind of help um, educate the public on the signs of stroke. So face, arm, speech, and then time is critical. So if you recognize any of these symptoms, to call 911 uh, right away. So. Um, and that helps allow uh, pre-hospital notification, which uh, is not universal yet, but um, we are doing it here at Queens, and it um, has become more common nationwide to try to be able to have the EMS alert the ED that there is a stroke patient coming in so that the stroke team and all the resources that are going to be needed to treat that patient are ready the, uh, the second the patient walks in the ER. Uh, there are, you know, there are different stroke screens. The ones we use here is the Los Angeles pre-hospital stroke screen. So this is um, done by the um, EMT in the ambulance to try to uh, alert the hospital uh, or the ER when the patient's coming in that they is a good chance they might be having a stroke. So the LAPS um, tool uh, looks at if a patient is over 45 and if they're having any new onset of neurologic symptoms within the last 24 hours. And they look specifically just at, it's a very rapid assessment, so they look very quickly just at if there's facial weakness or arm weakness. And, and if, they're, if the answer is yes to all of these, then the patient rules in as lapse positive and it is pretty sensitive at uh, being accurate for detecting an acute stroke. Uh, so the next step is once the patient actually gets into the ED, just like any other medical emergency, uh, you need to ensure um, the patient is actually stable so that you still have to um, look at a patient and, and do the um, normal ABCs, make sure they're stable. Uh, and it is important with acute stroke patients, you always want to make sure to check a glucose because uh, hypoglycemia can definitely mimic a stroke, and we see that pretty often. Um, and, and then a rapid neurologic assessment. So we usually use the NIH stroke scale, and then is a very rapid way to examine a patient to get an idea of um, if they're having a stroke and what the potential severity of the stroke is. And then also you're going to want to take them for a stat um, CAT scan of their head um, to get an idea of what's going on. So the NI stroke scale is, uh, like I said, a very rapid way to assess an acute stroke patient. And it actually can help predict whether the patient's having a small vessel or a large vessel stroke. And it's actually predictive of long-term outcome in stroke patients. And this is usually uh, how most patients are assessed in clinical trials. Uh, it's an 11-item scoring system, and the score is from 0 to 42. Um, and, oops, sorry. And in terms of uh, stroke mimics, um, these are very important things to keep in mind when you see a patient in the ED, because everyone that comes into the ER with focal weakness or aphasia doesn't necessarily mean they're having a stroke. Um, so certain things to keep in mind that can mimic a stroke are, like I mentioned earlier, hypoglycemia. Um, patients who have a seizure can have a post-ictal Todd's paralysis or aphasia that can mimic a stroke. Um, patients who have complicated migraines, such as hemiplegic migraines, those that can look like a stroke as well. Um, certain conditions like multiple sclerosis or brain tumors can also look like strokes. And then um, certain psychiatric conditions, such as conversion disorder, which we see a good amount of, actually can, can mimic a stroke as well. So it's kind of important to keep all those things in mind. Uh, so the next step, once you examine the patient and take them to imaging, is what type of imaging are you going to order? And so for the most part, anyone, everyone is going to get, a, um, for the most part, a non-contrast head CT. And uh, what you're looking for there are a few things is um, obviously hemorrhage. If there's hemorrhage, you're not going to be giving that patient TPA. But, um, but the other things you're looking for are early signs of ischemia. So one of the things you look for is what we call a hyperdense MCA sign. Uh, 
And that actually is basically, I have a picture of it coming up, but it, it basically actually shows you the clot on the CAT scan. And, um, can, and if, uh, if you have a high suspicion the patient's having a large vessel occlusion and you see that on CAT scan, um, it's probably at that point in time to start thinking about if that patient's going to be a candidate for endovascular uh, intervention. Um, you're also looking for early ischemic changes on the CAT scan. Um, so there are different ways to um, measure this. Um, one way is with the aspect score. And this is to look to see if there's any early signs of infarct that have already set in. Um, and that's important because if you're considering any TPA or endovascular therapy, um, you know, that could potentially increase the risk of hemorrhagic conversion of the stroke. In terms of other imaging, um, it is kind of something you always hear debated about whether a CT or MRI is, is a better imaging modality when someone's having an acute stroke um, and, you know, right when they walk in. Um, but in, pra in kind of practical purposes, most places are not going to have an MRI readily available 24 hours a day or an MRI tech in-house, and it is a more time-consuming study. Um, so for the most part, CT is usually going to be the more cost or, or more time-effective uh, way to uh, evaluate a patient uh, emergently in the ER. Um, there are certain situations where if the patient's presenting with somewhat of an atypical presentation that it might be reasonable to do a quick MRI and just do a limited MRI with only a few sequences to, to try to get an idea if you're not quite sure uh, what's causing the patient's symptoms. But for the most part, CT is going to be the initial imaging modality. So this picture here, this is an uh, example of a hyperdense MCA sign. So you can see right here. Um, on the right side, there is a bright signal there, and that's actually the middle cerebral artery, and it's, you can see a clear difference between the two sides. And that is actually the clot itself on the, so it's the right middle cerebral artery, and uh, that's actually thrombus. So if you see that on the initial CAT scan, even before the CT angiogram is done, you know the patient's probably got a large vessel occlusion. It might be um, appropriate to call the interventionist at that point. Uh, so this is the aspect score. So this is just an example of what I was mentioning earlier. This is a way to try to identify um, if there's early signs of infarct already apparent on CAT scan. Um, so basically, all the different areas you see labeled there are different areas of the middle cerebral artery territory. And so basically, the aspect score is, is a score up to 10, and 10 is considered normal, meaning that there's no sign of any early ischemia. Each one of these areas, if you start seeing some blurring of the gray-white differentiation or it starts looking a little bit hypodense on the CAT scan, each area you lose one point. If the score gets down to a 7, that's about equivalent to about one-third of the MCA territory. And basically, less than that uh, is probably a, a high risk of hemorrhagic conversion if you're, gonna, if you're considering giving that patient TPA or uh, sending them to the angio suite for endovascular therapy. So that's kind of how we use the aspect score kind of in the acute period when we're seeing a patient. Uh, in terms of vascular imaging, this is something uh, that I think is very important that all acute stroke patients should get some type of vascular imaging, uh, especially if they're in the window for TPA or um, mechanical thrombectomy. Um, and if they are in the window, CTA is probably a better study to do at that point, again, because it's much quicker than an MRI and can give you a little bit more information as well. Um, if the patient's out of the window and they're not going to be considered for any uh, hyperacute therapy, um, then an MRA might be reasonable at that point since you're probably going to want an MRI um, as well so you can get them both done at the same time. And that's probably, um, you know, that's probably a common way that um, a lot of patients will get imaged if they're not uh, eligible for TPA or thrombectomy. The reason the CTA is um, useful, especially if you're considering endovascular therapies, it can give you a good idea of collateral, um, the collateral circulation which is kind of a way to triage if a patient is going to benefit or not from endovascular therapy. Um, and another imaging option is CT or MR perfusion, which um, is, is being used um, around the country at some centers, not everywhere. There's still some question about the ideal times and situations to use it, um, but it can be useful if someone presents with a, without a clear time of onset, for example, or a wake-up stroke um, that you think might benefit from some type of revascularization. Um, so this is just an example of um, different types of collateral circulation that we can see. So this is a multi-phase CT angio. So if you look on the top row, um, that's an example of good collateral circulation. So you see where the arrow is. There's a MCA occlusion, but there's still pretty good filling, um, still good contrast on all three phases of the CAT scan, um, indicating pretty good collateral circulation. So that's a patient that if you take them to the angio suite and do a thrombectomy to remove the blood clot, they'll probably do well. Uh, the next row down, that's an example of intermediate collaterals. Uh, 
So you still see some filling, but not as robust as the row on the top. Um, and then on the bottom is an example of poor collateral. So you can see hardly any filling on the, op on the other side, actually, this uh, right MCA, but very little filling there. So that's a patient that probably um, you might want to have uh, second thoughts if you're considering taking that for a thrombectomy, because those are the patients that tended to not do very well in a lot of the clinical trials. Uh, so this is just a quick example of a perfusion imaging. This is CT perfusion. And basically the information you're looking for is uh, on this imaging modality is does the patient have a, perf uh, a mismatch? And what that means is if you look there where the red area is um, on the left, that's uh, the core infarct. So that's the tissue that's already stroked out basically. All the green area around it is tissue at risk uh, but still has, but has not completely infarcted. So that's basically considered the penumbra or the salvageable tissue. So if you see something like that, that might um, tell you that there's still a lot of tissue that can be saved and that patient might benefit from um, endovascular therapy. Uh, and again, that, this is a situation where these, the perfusion studies is useful is when the time of onset is not very clear or uh, the patient had a wake-up stroke. So IV thrombolysis or TPA, obviously this is uh, you know, one of the mainstays of acute stroke treatment. Um, until last year, this was actually the only approved treatment for acute ischemic stroke. Um, TPA does increase the likelihood of good functional outcome. And the, the inclusion criteria are pretty simple, actually. Uh, basically, if you make a clinical diagnosis of ischemic stroke and the symptom onsets within four and a half hours, and the patient's 18 or over, and there's no hemorrhage on CAT scan, then that patient should be considered for TPA. Uh, in terms of exclusion criteria, um, these have actually gone a little bit more lenient and have uh, become a, um, a lot of the former contraindications have now become more relative contraindications um, and have, uh, they have left a lot of discretion to the, uh, the provider. Uh, but some of the obvious exclusion criteria for TPA are, again, if you see any hemorrhage on the CT scan, um, if the patient has persistently elevated blood pressure above 185 over 110 and you can bring it down with medication, um, that patient should not get TPA because of the risk of hemorrhagic conversion. Uh, if the patient had a recent surgery, like a cabbage or something like that, they probably should not be considered for TPA. And then if the patient's coagulopathic or, again, if they have already a large size of infarct on the CAT scan um, or if they have any active bleeding, such as a GI bleed. Um, in terms of door-to-needle time, this is something that's stressed at most stroke centers because uh, we know that um, every minute is crucial in terms of um, salvaging brain cells. Um, the goal of door-to-needle time is 60 minutes, um, but this can be done much faster if you have a system in place that runs very smoothly. Um, so we, do routine, we will um, commonly have some patients get TPA in under 20 minutes door-to-needle time here. Um, and there are certain ways you can set your system up to try to, you know, get that. But obviously that requires a lot of, uh, you know, multidisciplinary team effort to get that done. Um, in terms of blood pressure parameters for TPA, um, before you give it, you, the blood pressure has to be less than 185 over 110. Um, after you give the TPA, that parameter becomes 180 over 105. And... In term, other things to consider when you're giving a, or considering a patient for IV TPA is are their symptoms minor or are they improving? And this is something that we'll see commonly where the symptoms might improve in the ED but not quite all the way back to normal. Uh, and that's still kind of an unanswered question. There are still trials going on looking at this, but uh, it is kind of up to clinical judgment. But we sometimes will give TPA for very minor improving symptoms because even if symptoms improve, people can have fluctuating courses with stroke, and even if they improve, there's still a chance they could get worse again. So I think part of it depends on what type of symptoms they're having, and uh, so, that, you know, that, but that, that's still being studied right now. Um, other things with TPA, if, the, if you do a CT angiogram and you see that the, the clot itself is 8 millimeters or larger, um, there are studies that have shown that TPA will not work for clots that large, uh, so probably um, that might be a patient that might need to be considered for thrombectomy. Uh, in terms of the three to four and a half hour time window, um, there are some, um, some exclusion criteria for giving TPA to patients in this time window. Uh, if they've had a stroke before and they're diabetic, or if they have an NI stroke cell of 25 or above, or if they're on any anticoagulants, um, regardless of INR, those patients were excluded from the trial that um, extended the time window to four and a half hours. Also, patients over 80 is also mentioned, but there have been, you know, uh, subgroup analyses and meta-analyses that have actually shown that you can safely give TPA to patients over 80 in the four and a half hour time window. So I, I would still give uh, TPA to patients um, 
over 80 if it's within four and a half hours. Um, so in terms of endovascular treatment, um, this is basically referring to intraarterial thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy done via catheter angiogram. Um, this is a treatment that has been done for over 10 years, um, but up until recently, there, um, the clinical benefit was never proven with clinical trials, so there was, it was in a state of clinical equipoise, um, per se. Um, there were three large trials that came out in 2013 that, showed, that failed to show a clear benefit with this treatment, um, but there was no harm. And there were several different reasons for why the trials were, um, didn't show any benefit. And basically, um, what you're trying to achieve with, with thrombectomy is this. So you see an abrupt cutoff of the middle cerebral artery there where the arrow is, and the picture on the right is basically um, an example of recanalization of that blood vessel. So the clot is able to be physically removed, blood flows reestablished to the MCA territory. So this is a good radiographic outcome, and you're hoping that that equates to a good clinical outcome also. Um, but finally, there are positive trials um, that have proven the benefit of thrombectomy now. Um, the first trial came out in October of 2014, and after this trial came out, there were six other ongoing trials that were stopped early and uh, found that there was a clear treatment benefit um, with the thrombectomy groups. So uh, basically, and there have been multiple meta-analyses looking at all these trials. There was one that came out this year that looked, over, uh, looked at over 1,200 patients and showed us um, with mechanical thrombectomy, there was a significant decrease in disability at 90 days, an increase in functional independence, and there was no difference um, across subgroups, meaning that um, patients in all subgroups um, got the benefit from the treatment. So at this point now, um, it is considered standard of care as well as TPA. Um, as long as there's a confirmed proximal occlusion, and there is, is favorable in, in a favorable imaging profile. So meaning there's a high aspect score and intermediate to good collaterals on CT angiogram or a good um, perfusion uh, imaging profile. Uh, with endovascular therapy, you can still consider it in elderly patients. It's what's more important is really what the patient's um, functional status is before the stroke. You know, a patient who's already wheelchair bound and, uh, you know, dependent on others for ADLs, for example, is not going to be a good candidate. You want someone who is somewhat functionally independent before. Um, it's similar to TPA in the, in the sense that time is still very crucial, that there are better outcomes with shorter time to reperfusion. Um, for every five-minute delay, the one out of 100 patients will have a worse modified Rankin scale, um, which is a measure of disability. Um, and in terms of the goal time, um, the goal time to reperfusion should be six hours. Um, five hours and less is really where the patients do best, but um, within six hours, patients should be considered. So once the patient is triaged in the ED and you determine whether or not they're going to get acute treatment in terms of TPA or thrombectomy, the next step is they get admitted, and then some kind of, you know, mainstays of treatment are gonna, is going to be that you're going to put them on some type of antiplatelet initially. Unless they got TPA, then you have to wait 24 hours. Um, you're going to allow for some permissive hypertension to allow increased perfusion pressure to the brain, and you want to hydrate them with normal saline, also to keep them hydrated, increase perfusion pressure. Um, important to know, you probably should avoid D5 because that can exacerbate cerebral edema, um, and you want to keep them head of bed flat if possible, um, and then probably keep them NPO um, until they get a s swallow evaluation so that as to avoid aspiration pneumonia, and you want to do frequent neuro checks because again. In the first 24 to 48 hours after a stroke, patients can, can deteriorate or get worse. Um, a common question is what to do with blood pressure in the acute stroke period, and this, again, is not a, there's no clear answer to this yet. Um, the long-term benefit of lowering blood pressure for primary and secondary stroke prevention is very clear, well-established um, in the literature, um, but the effect of immediately lowering the blood pressure is not, is not clear yet. Um, and there have been studies that have shown that if you decrease the blood pressure acutely, there have been studies showing better outcomes, worse outcomes, or no difference. So we don't really have a clear answer on what to do with blood pressure in the acute period. Um, there have been several trials. One of them was the CADIS trial. Um, this was done in China, and this looked at um, 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 intentionally lowering blood pressure in the first 24 hours after a stroke compared to um, not treating the blood pressure. And this basically, this trial showed no, there was no difference. So they basically showed that um, lowering blood pressure acutely after an ischemic stroke does not improve or worsen outcome. So it's really up to clinical judgment. 
Um, so probably the situations where permissive hypertension is most important is a patient who's got a known arterial stenosis in the distribution of the stroke, and then in patients who have small vessel lacunar strokes. It's probably not quite as important um, in embolic strokes, for example, but with, the, with these stroke subtypes, these are patients that you might want to keep hypertensive a little bit longer. And in terms of how long, again, there's no, uh, there's no clear um, standard in that sense. So once you treat the patient and you have them on the right medications and all that, the next step is going to be the workup because um, the, one of the big parts about treating a stroke is trying to figure out what the etiology of the stroke is because that's going to tailor um, your, your, stroke, your secondary stroke prevention strategy. Um, so all patients should get their lipids checked, a hemoglobin A1C. They should be put on telemetry monitoring to look for atrial fibrillation, and they should get a transthoracic echo um, with bubble study to look for a PFO. Um, again, all stroke patients should get vascular imaging, um, especially and if it was not done in the ED, it should still be done. Um, and that includes extracranial and intracranial vessels because that can change your um, treatment plan. And ESR and CRP should be checked also. That uh, very easy test. And as you'll see, it's very common that you uh, do an extensive workup and don't come to a clear etiology for the patient's stroke. So sometimes if you see an elevated ESR, that might imply there might be some type of underlying inflammatory condition or even a malignancy. Um, so important to check those also. So some of the things that go through my mind when I see a stroke patient and when you, you're looking at their imaging is to help categorize what type of stroke they had is you want to ask, does that stroke look embolic? Um, and by that, that means is the stroke in a cortical location? Is there multiple strokes in uh, different vascular territories? in the setting of normal vasculature, especially in the area of the strokes. If so, then you should be very suspicious that the stroke might be a cardioembolic stroke, meaning most likely from atrial fibrillation, but in the right clinical scenario, endocarditis, um, aortic arch atheromas can cause embolic strokes or PFOs. So if you are suspect, if the stroke does appear embolic on imaging um, and you don't have a clear etiology, those patients uh, should get transesophageal echoes also. Um, to evaluate the left atrial appendage and the aortic arch. And they should get some type of prolonged cardiac monitoring, which we'll talk about. Um, so this is just an example of an infarct that I would say looks embolic. It's a wedge-shaped infarct in the cortex. So if I saw that and the blood vessels on this side of the brain are normal, then to me that, that looks like an embolic stroke. If it doesn't look embolic, then the next question is, does the stroke look like a watershed type of stroke? Um, if so, then that is... To me, that means the, the patient has carotid stenosis until proven otherwise. Um, and if the carotid stenosis is extracranially in the neck, that patient should be considered for uh, some type of revascularization with, with either endarterectomy or carotid stenting. If there's intracranial stenosis of the carotid artery or the middle cerebral artery, for example, those are patients that you might want to treat with um, 90 days of aspirin and Plavix, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. But again, a reason why intracranial imaging is very important also of, of the vasculature. If there's bilateral watershed strokes, that's when you think about could there be some type of systemic hypoperfusion, uh, either from uh, hypotension or uh, acute blood loss. So this is just a picture of a, um, a typical pattern of a watershed stroke. So this is kind of what we call a string of pearls sign. And so this is very typical and classic for carotid stenosis. Um, the other subcategory to think about is the stroke subcortical. Um, and this is an example of a small vessel lacunar stroke. This is usually from small vessel disease, um, from hypertension and things like that. In terms of um, other less common etiologies, if the patient doesn't fall into any of those categories and they don't have any obvious risk factors, and they're, or they're younger, you might want to consider a hypercoagulable workup to see are they prone to blood clots. Um, you might want to consider doing a vasculitis workup to see if they have some type of underlying autoimmune condition that could have uh, led to um, vasculitis and strokes. And in certain situations, you might want to consider doing a pan-CT scan to look for malignancy also. Uh, and this is just kind of an example of different um, ischemic stroke subtypes and what the different causes are. Um, again, uh, we kind of went through those. Um, so then the next step, again, is secondary stroke prevention. And again, the mainstays of treatment there are antithrombotic therapy, and whether that's antiplatelets or anticoagulation depends on, on the patient. Um, you want to put patients on statins, and blood pressure control and glucose control are very important also. Um, and these all have a cumulative effect on um, risk reduction of stroke. 
After the patient is discharged, it's important to counsel them on smoking, alcohol, drug cessation if it's relevant. Um, the Mediterranean diet is what we usually recommend because that's been shown to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke and advocating for some type of uh, physical exercise uh, as well. In terms of what antiplatelet to use, um, that's something that, you know, there are a lot of trials that have compared aspirin to aspirin and Plavix combination. Um, and most of them have showed no benefit to using aspirin and Plavix and have shown increased risk of bleeding. Um, and so one of the, you know, for the most part, you know, the, one of the main situations where you want to use aspirin and Plavix, um, like I mentioned, alluded to earlier, is in settings of intracranial stenosis. Um, this is based off the Sampras trial, and this basically, this trial looked at aggressive medical therapy um, for intracranial stenosis compared to angioplasty and stenting. And this trial used uh, 90 days of aspirin and Plavix and aggressive blood pressure and um, cholesterol control and was found to be um, superior. So this is a situation where we would use um, dual antiplatelets. Patients with atrial fibrillation, you're probably familiar with the chads vas score. This is how we determine who to anticoagulate. A score of two or more, you should anticoagulate them if there's no contraindications. Um, if it's one, then you use your clinical judgment, but can still be considered. Um, the has blood score is very important to try to help in terms of categorizing who would be high risk for anticoagulating patients. And in terms of oral anticoagulation, you know, we used to mainly be warfarin, but now we have the NOAX. Um, we have dabigatran, um, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, um, and there actually now is an FDA-approved reversal agent for this. And we have factor 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. And these are, um, you know, have been studied head-to-head -head against warfarin and have been found to have about a 20% decreased risk of stroke compared to warfarin and about a 50% re reduced risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, the one caveat, there is a slightly higher risk of GI bleeding with the NOACs compared to warfarin, um, but this is not true for apixaban, which is why I think apixaban uh, is probably one of the um, best of the NOACs. Um, so there still are situations where you want to keep patients on warfarin if they're already on it, they have stable INRs, or if they have advanced kidney disease, or if there's financial limitations. Otherwise, the NOACs are more convenient. There's no blood testing. There's less medication interactions. They're safer, and they're more effective. Um, patients who may not be a good candidate for anticoagulation, if they have a high has blood score, for example, um, left atrial appendage closure is an option also. Um, this is a relatively new procedure being done by the cardiologists where they can actually, um, by angiogram, go into the left atrial appendage and put in a type of mesh basically to block it off because that's where the blood clots in patients who have AFib form before they go out into the systemic circulation. Um, so this is basically a percutaneous occlusion of the left atrial appendage. Um, and the Watchman is one of the devices. That's the only one that's FDA approved right now, and that's the one we use here at Queens. Um, so this picture is just kind of showing um, actually how the procedure is done. And then once the mesh is put in, it's left there, and it takes about six weeks to epithelialize. And this is a way to avoid lifelong anticoagulation uh, for patients. Cryptogenic strokes, these are very common. Unfortunately, about one-third of all stroke patients are considered cryptogenic, meaning you do all that workup we just talked about and you still don't have a clear etiology. And these are patients that a, a big percentage of them are felt to probably have atrial fibrillation that's just not diagnosed. Uh, so these are patients that you want to consider for more prolonged cardiac monitoring. The guidelines say you want to monitor for at least 24 hours. Um, but there have been lots of studies that have come out and have shown that the longer you monitor these patients, the more likely you are to find AFib. Um, so, for example, the Crystal AF trial used actually an implantable uh, cardiac monitor um, and found that the detection rate of AFib at three years was up to 30 percent compared to 3 percent in the standard monitoring group. Um, so this is something that we will commonly um, recommend to our patients. So these are examples of um, these implantable cardiac monitors or loop recorders. The one on the top is the link. This is it's a much smaller device, and they're very small, and it's a very simple, safe procedure. Um, so this is something that can be considered in patients who have a stroke of unclear etiology, especially if the stroke looks embolic on imaging. Uh, this is a picture of the Zio patch. This is something it's less invasive, and this can be done uh, maybe before jumping to the loop recorder. This is a patch a patient can wear for two weeks to monitor for AFib. So often I'll, I'll do this first, and if this doesn't find any AFib, then I'll um, recommend the loop recorder to the patient. I briefly mentioned aortic atheroma. Um, this is something you uh, might find a large, complex, or mobile aortic atheroma on TE, on transesophageal echo. This is a situation 
where there is some data um, suggesting that dual antiplatelets might be beneficial in that situation. So pretty much the only time, uh, I think the situation where there's decent data to use aspirin and Plavix together is intracranial stenosis, um, a um, aortic atheroma, or a patient who has a dissection and had a stent placed. Um, aspirin and Plavix is being studied. Uh, there's a large trial going on looking at aspirin and Plavix in minor stroke and TIA. Um, so that might add to this list uh, in the next couple of years. I won't spend too much time on PFOs, but this is uh, something else that we look for. Um, but the question is when you find it, do you close them or not? Um, and it's kind of controversial at this point. There's kind of two schools of thought, but basically the main trials that have looked at this did not clearly show a benefit to closing PFOs. Um, and there are, there's something called a rope score. This is how you, a score to calculate what the likelihood that somebody's stroke is attributable to a PFO. Um, and in terms of when to close a PFO, again, is debatable. Uh, and my, based on my interpretation of the studies and my practice, I usually, if somebody has a stroke and it's their first stroke and they, and they have a PFO and a high rope score indicating it's likely related to the PFO, I still don't send them to the cardiologist to close them um, because I think the, you know, the benefit has not been clearly shown. Um, but if they have a second event, a second TIA or stroke, then I would strongly consider it. And interestingly, the FDA actually just approved um, one of the PFO occluders a couple weeks ago. Um, so again, so this is it, kind of everything I went through just kind of shows that secondary prevention really is dependent on the etiology of the stroke. And it really, the treatments can be very different. So that's why it's really important uh, to do a good workup uh, when somebody has a stroke. And very quickly, carotid stenosis, um, differentiating symptomatic and asymptomatic is important. Symptomatic carotid stenosis are patients you might want to consider for uh, to have them eval be evaluated by vascular surgeons um, for endarterectomy or stenting. If asymptomatic, medical therapy might be better. Dissections, um, there's been a question of anticoagulation versus antiplatelets. And there is finally uh, the first trial that compared this, showed no benefit. So for the most part, antiplatelet therapy is probably recommended, but there are some situations where you might want to um, use anticoagulation. After discharge, what becomes important, rehab, obviously, physical, occupational, and speech therapy, and then control of all these risk factors. Um, so basically, uh, that's pretty much it. So in summary, um, optimal stroke treatment depends on rapid presentation to the ED, a extensive, thorough medical workup and treatment strategy, and then ensuring uh, post-hospital follow-up of the patient and patient compliance also. Uh, thank you. That's it.